and learning about history is an, is an uphill battle. We're so focused on the present. We look, you know, we look forward to the future. So few of us actually pause to reflect on the past, on where we've come from and how it, how it shapes who we are today. So to see so many people who are here to, to learn about history and to think about its impact on our world is truly heartening. College campuses, especially the venerable ones like Georgetown, you can see how venerable it is. Uh, Georgetown, where I work, uh, typically present very well manicured landscapes of historical memory. The old buildings stand as monuments to the past, even as their interiors are updated with, with Wi Fi and glass and all sorts of gleaming, shiny things. Coffee shops. The buildings are usually named after founders whose fame has faded. And in truth, few people on campus really know who they actually were until those founders become infamous and the well-manicured landscape of historical memory starts to show signs of blight. Now, I teach history at Georgetown University. I teach and write about slavery and emancipation largely in the Deep South. But recently, my attention has turned closer to, closer to home. So I says, in our own backyard, to my own institution. Now, last year, I had the privilege of serving as a member of Georgetown University's working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. The group was formed uh, in September 2015 at the behest of the university's president, John DeJoya who asked us to reflect on how Georgetown should, and I quote, acknowledge and recognize Georgetown's historic relationship with the institution of slavery. Now, the immediate cause of the formation of the working group, what prompted President DeJoya to, to form this body, was the reopening of a newly renovated Mullady Hall a hall that was named after Reverend Thomas uh, F. Mullady of the Society of Jesus, who was the president of Georgetown University in the 1830s. Now here's the problem, the scandal with Mullady, which is now well known, at least I, I hope it's well known. He orchestrated the mass sale of more than 200, nearly 300 men, women, and children who were owned by the Maryland Jesuits in 1838, and he used at least part of the proceeds of that sale to rescue the college from debt. It's, uh, it's safe to say, and rather shocking to understand, that Georgetown really owes its existence to, uh, to the sale of those slaves in 1838. The proceeds of that sale saved the college. President uh, DeJoya rightly grasped that the present moment was ripe for the Georgetown community to have a difficult conversation about this history. And he did that, I think, for many reasons. He, he understood the moment for many reasons. Um, one of them was all of the things that were roiling co uh, college campuses last year, uh, the student protests, the uh, against uh, injustice, indignity uh, that was, that was um, being uh, perpetrated on people of color. But also, President Joy knew the history of Georgetown. He was aware of its roots in the institutions of slavery. And I will add that new scholarship, like uh, Professor Craig Wilder's book, Ebony and Ivy, have put the issue of slavery and American colleges and universities back in our mental landscape. So we are, our work builds on the shoulders of many other scholars and archivists and activists. Uh, and that whole community has helped us to do our work. Now, I want to emphasize that Georgetown's history of slavery was never a secret 
a relatively small group of scholars, alumni, and students, uh, I'm one of them, uh, has known about this history for a fairly long time. There's excellent scholarship on the subject. And I especially want to applaud the efforts of one of my predecessors at Georgetown, who was briefly a colleague of mine, Professor Emmett Curran, who's now retired. Uh, uh, Professor Curran wrote a bicentennial history of Georgetown that was published in 1989, 1989, that exposed the college's roots in slavery. He wrote about this 1838 sale, sale and its consequences for the college a long time before the working group started its work. Then in the 1990s, our American Studies program uh, began to teach about Georgetown and slavery, incorporating this history into its curriculum and creating a pioneering website called the Jesuit Plantation Project that published some of the same documents we put on the Georgetown Slavery Archive. So they did it well before we did. Student journalists, including one member of the working group, uh, Matthew Quallen, uh, wrote about Georgetown's slaveholding past in campus uh, newspapers and periodicals, uh, and I might say scooping the Washington Post as they did so. <laughs> and yet, for all of this, when the working group began its work last year, uh, we were surprised to discover how little uh, we and most people knew about this subject and how shocking Georgetown's links to slavery were for most people around our community. Most people simply did not know the history. So I, I feel like that is a, a failure of, uh, uh, of, of scholars like myself uh, who have written about this stuff but have not done enough to get it out to the public, to really have this history penetrate people's consciousness, both at the university and beyond it. This history, in a very real way, was lost to us, buried underneath the university's landscape of memory. It seems to me that the first step in truth and reconciliation is truth. So excavating this history and publicizing it has become one of our key tasks. That's what I've really been devoted to as a member of the working group. Now, to accomplish that, we've been digging in archives at Georgetown, where the archives of the Maryland province are, now reside, and archives in other places as well, including right here at the National Archives, which just has extraordinary material on the history of American slavery. So we've been digging around to find original documents that can shed light on this history and we're trying to make them available on our website called the Georgetown Slavery Archive, slaveryarchive.georgetown.edu. So today I'd like to walk you through a handful of these documents to give you a sense of the depth and extent of Georgetown's roots in American slavery and to introduce you to some of the central questions and challenges raised by this material. So we are a gathering of people who are interested in history, and so I hope you don't mind if I dwell on the past. It's really what we do. So to begin uh, with this, um, to begin with this history, I'm going to go back a bit farther in time into a more distant location than you might expect me to. In the early 1600s, 1610s and 1620s, a Jesuit priest named Alonso de Sandoval began to minister to newly arrived Africans in the port city of Cartagena in what is today Colombia. Sandoval worked at the Jesuit college there, he was a Jesuit, 150 years before the founding of Georgetown. As he met with sick and dying Africans on the docks in Cartagena, Sandoval began to have some doubts about the morality of the system of slavery that he encountered. He began to ask some pesky questions of his colleagues, Jesuits, around the Atlantic world, like whether those Africans he was meeting with in Cartagena had been illegally enslaved. A Jesuit priest named Luis Brandao, who was stationed across the ocean in Luanda, in what is today Angola, where many of the Africans had been embarked, 
actually wrote Sandoval a letter addressing his concerns, a truly remarkable letter that, that tried to ease Sandoval's conscience. Sandoval included the letter in a massive tome that he published in Seville in 1627 called On Restoring Ethiopian Salvation. Here's a title page from that tome on the left and uh, a part of the manuscript on the right that I want to tell you about. And I want to thank one of my graduate students, Elsa Barraza Mendoza, for finding this for me. It's good to have, good to have students. <laughs> Don't worry, Father Brandauer wrote. Wise men of good conscience do not find slavery reprehensible. That's a quotation from the book, from the letter. Rather, the Jesuits buy slaves, quote, without feeling any guilt, unquote. It was true, he admitted, that no black slave, quote, ever says he deserved to be enslaved, unquote. Uh, but he warned Sandoval not to ask them for their opinions. <laughs> Can you imagine? Quote, they will always say they were stolen or taken illegally, hoping that this will help them get their freedom, unquote. So that's, that's why you shouldn't ask them, because they're going to give you an answer you don't like. Father Brindau concluded that too many souls were saved through enslavement to worry about the few who might actually have been illegally enslaved. And that's, that's right here on this, on this page, uh, the text of the letter. Now, Sandoval bought the argument. He made peace with slavery and devoted his life to saving the souls of the 100,000 captive Africans transported to Cartagena in the first half of the 17th century. Now, although it took, a pl it took place a long way from the founding of Georgetown, I mention this correspondence because uh, I mention this correspondence between Sandoval and Brandau because it tells us something important about the intellectual, religious, and social world of Atlantic slavery that the Maryland Jesuits came to inhabit. Slavery and the Atlantic slave trade had long been rationalized by Christian arguments that prized salvation over earthly freedom. In fact, the Jesuit college in Cartagena, where Sandoval worked, went so far as to purchase enslaved Africans who served as translators to aid Sandoval's missionary efforts. Moreover, uh, the attempt to justify slavery required Sandoval and his fellow Jesuits to dismiss, ignore, and ultimately silence captive Africans' own protests against their enslavement. To listen to them, to take their grievances seriously, would have threatened the entire enterprise. The Jesuits arrived in Maryland in 1634, not long after Sandoval published his treatise in Seville. I can't say whether they knew about it or not. They probably didn't. But what we do know is that it took decades for slavery to get firmly implanted in Maryland. For a half century, indentured servants and tenant farmers from Europe supplied the labor needs for the tobacco economy in Maryland and the Chesapeake. It was not until the end of the 17th century, the 1680s and 1690s, that large numbers of captive Africans began to arrive in the colony, and the labor force began to tilt towards slavery. The Jesuits, along with other Catholics, participated in Maryland's great transition from servitude to slavery, and became, in some cases, large slave owners in the first half of the 18th century. The record you're looking at now dates back to that era, what the University of Maryland historian Ira Berlin, one of the great historians of American slavery, calls the plantation generation of slavery in colonial North America. Now, this is a list of slaves who were brought from the Jesuits' white marsh plantation 
uh, in Prince George's County to the St. Joseph Mission in Talbot County on the Eastern Shore. I want to draw your attention to the first name in the list, uh, a woman named Nanny. Do you see it, the first name? A woman named Nanny. Uh, she's identified in this record as a 55-year-old Guinea Negro. The names are, the names are, 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 are tantalizing. You want, to, you want to know so much more about who these people are, but there's just so little information. Her name was Nanny, and she was born in Africa around 1710. That's all we know right now. All we really know is what's on that page. Nanny is the only enslaved person in the Maryland province mentioned in the Maryland province archives who I've come across so far who is identified as being African-born. And this record is perhaps the sole piece of evidence linking the Maryland Jesuit slave community to their African origins. The other people on this list were all born in Maryland and baptized with English names like Tom, Frank, and Lucy. And like most of the slaves named in the Maryland province archives, their last names are not recorded. All of this, uh, I think, are symptoms of what the sociologist Orlando Patterson calls the natal alienation of slavery, the cutting off of people from their ancestry. From the first indications of Jesuit slaveholding in Maryland in the 1710s, the Jesuit plantation continued to grow across the 18th century. A census in 1765 taken by a Jesuit counted nearly 200 slaves on the Jesuit plantations. The plantations were primarily located in southern Maryland, in St. Mary's County and Charles County. But there were also uh, missions and plantations further north and on the eastern shore. The suppression of the Jesuits in the 1770s posed new challenges for the Catholic uh, leadership in the colony, and new organizational forms emerged to steward the Jesuit order's property and slaves, including the corporation of Roman Catholic clergymen. Georgetown College was founded to advance Catholic education in the new United States in 1789. And it was established by Mar Maryland, the Maryland Catholic planter elite and a Jesuit order that was deeply invested in slavery at the local level. And the basic idea was that the Jesuit plantations would help to pay for uh, the churches and the schools. So Georgetown rests on the foundation of a slave economy. Now the Jesuits and their um, Catholic congregants were not the only people in Maryland to draw inspiration from the ideals of the American Revolution. And it was really to prove that there was a place for Catholics in this new republic that uh, Georgetown was founded. It seems that the Jesuits' own slaves also drew inspiration from the ideals of the American Revolution and thought that the principles of freedom and equality articulated by the revolution should apply to them. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, a number of slaves belonging to Jesuit owners including owners closely affiliated with Georgetown, sued in local courts for their freedom. Three families in particular, the Butlers, the Mahonies, and the Queens, took their owners to court, and in some cases were successful. One of these freedom seekers was a man named Edward Queen, who filed this complaint against Reverend John Ashton, with the General Court of the Western Shore in 1791. I don't know how, if you, from where you're sitting, if you can read the handwriting in this petition, but I assure you, this is among the more legible documents uh, that we've uh, encountered. Um, 
And I should add as well that this document comes from a wonderful website uh, created by uh, University of Nebraska professor uh, William Thomas about um, these various uh, freedom suits in the early republic. Um, so this is an example of the kind of collaboration uh, and, and other people's scholarship that we've really benefited from. So if you can read this petition, uh, Queen is claiming his freedom on the basis of dissent from a free woman named Mary Queen who was his grandmother, grandmothers. Um, much like those captive Africans in Cartagena, Ed, uh, Edward Queen claimed to be illegally enslaved. But in this case, Queen actually won his, he was heard, and he won his case in the Maryland courts in 1794. Queen was a member of what Berlin calls the revolutionary generation of American slaves. Uh, and he's also part of this moment of transition in the Chesapeake, post after the American Revolution, when there's a brief window uh, of opportunity for enslaved people to make their way to freedom. This is a moment when the population of free people of color begins to expand tremendously. And I'll add that one of the pioneering historians of free people of color in this region was Letitia Woods Brown. But it's worth noting that in granting Queen his freedom on the relatively narrow ground of his freeborn grandmother, okay, and let me re remind you that in the law of slavery uh, in Maryland and most other places in the Americas, the children of enslaved women uh, uh, were also slaves. Right? So status followed the mother. And not only did their status follow the mother, not only would the children of slave women be slaves, but they, were, they would be owned by their mother's owner. Right? But if your mother is free, you, by rights, should be free as well. So that's the basis for Edward, uh, Edward Queen's claim to freedom. So, but in granting Queen his freedom on this relatively narrow ground of his freeborn grandmother, the courts also implicitly inf affirmed the enslavement of thousands of other enslaved people who could not establish their birthright in court. So you can see here uh, the powers that be in the slave society trying to, trying to make up rules by which slavery would be governed. It was a legal institution that operated by certain rules. Now, Reverend Ashton, for his part, was an Irish-born Jesuit who was stationed for many years at the White Marsh Plantation in Prince George's County. Now, he's listed in the 1790 census with 82 slaves next to his name, one of the biggest planters in the region. He also happened to be a founder of the Corporation of Roman Catholic Clergymen and one of the first directors of Georgetown College. It's, it's really remarkable how many connections to slavery turn up in the early records of the college itself. Uh, the, first, the first college ledgers, uh, which record uh, the, the students coming into the college and paying for room and board, their expenses, those, those first ledgers record the hiring of slaves. One was named Suki. She was hired to the college by her owner, William Diggs for 10 pounds per year from 1792 to 1797. So it's not just a question of ownership, but the use of labor, hiring and renting of slaves. Father John McElroy, whose journals record daily life at the college in the early 19th century, noted the presence of 13, quote, colored persons. That's how he describes them in his journal. Uh, out of 101 people in all at the college in 1813. So 13% of the people at the college in 1813 were slaves. Who they were or what they did, he failed to mention. But a later entry in his journal records the burial of a man named a man that he calls Billy the Blacksmith, probably a slave, who was buried in the college graveyard in a ceremony attended by many of the students. Holy Trinity Church, right next to Georgetown, uh, the sacramental registers of Holy Trinity record uh, slaves getting baptized and married right next door to campus. Uh, 
And William Gaston, Georgetown's acclaimed first student, many, at Georgetown, many of our sort of grand uh, lectures and occasions are held in Gaston Hall. Uh, Gaston came from a, a wealthy slave-owning family in North Carolina. He went on to become a distinguished judge on the North Carolina Supreme Court, uh, ruling in one case that a slave had a right to life, and in another that free people of color could be citizens of his state. So those two rulings were actually remarkably progressive for a North Carolina jurist uh, before the Civil War. I think it's important to understand that the significance of the use of slave labor at Georgetown and its close ties to slavery um, are not just an, an economic question, although they certainly are. Uh, but there's something deeper going on here. It's, it's about the, the way these inst institutions, churches, and schools shape the moral order of society, the normative order of society. So if people at Georgetown, if faculty and, it, and the presidents of Georgetown are routinely buying and selling slaves, hiring slaves, uh, well, what does that say um, to everybody else? It says that this is a, a uh, a perfectly reasonable, perfectly normal, uh, uh, perfectly um, moral institution. So I think you cannot underestimate the ideological effect of the participation of a place like Georgetown or the Jesuit order in slaveholding. One slave at Georgetown in these early years was a man named Isaac, who ran away from the college during the War of 1812, in uh, February of 18, actually in January of 1814. Father McElroy advertised his escape in a Washington newspaper, as you can see here. This is a just a runaway a runaway slave ad, of which there are thousands and thousands and thousands in American newspapers. But this happens to be one posted by uh, a Jesuit who was working at Georgetown College. And it says, $30, offers a $30 reward for the return of Isaac, who ran away from Georgetown College uh, on Saturday night, the 29th instant, a Negro man named Isaac, about 23 years old, quite black complexion, about five feet, eight inches high. So the advertisement, it gives a physical description of Isaac, tells the readers what he was wearing when he fled, but speculates that he's probably got a change of clothing with him. But it also notes that Isaac could read and may have procured a pass to allow him to move freely about the countryside. It guessed that he might be on his way to Pennsylvania, a freer state in 1814 than Maryland was. But I shouldn't, but, you, but understand that even if, even if Isaac had gotten to Maryland, that wouldn't make him free. Under the Fugitive Slave Clause of the Constitution, he was still bound to service and could be returned to the college. These runaway ads are very one-sided. We only get the perspective of the owner, and in most cases, you have no idea what, what actually happened. But in this case, McElroy's journal actually fills out some of the details. Turns out that Isaac was captured and thrown in jail in Baltimore. And Reverend Neal, one of McElroy's colleagues, sold him as punishment. There was not much mercy shown to Isaac. Once the War of 1812 concluded and the Society of Jesus was restored after its era of suppression, the Maryland Jesuits began to wrestle with the problem of slavery. But they did not exactly wrestle with it in an abolitionist way, uh, the way we might, have, we might want or expect them to have wrestled with it. A Jesuit brother, Joseph Moberly, wrote a, wrote a letter to the president of Georgetown in February of 1815 to propose getting rid of the slaves, either by selling them off or freeing them. Quote, it is better to sell for a time or to set your people free, he wrote. And these were his reasons. First, because we have their souls to answer for. 
Second, because blacks are more difficult to govern now than formerly. And maybe had Isaac uh, and Edward Queen in mind. And third, because we shall make more and more to our satisfaction. And what followed in this letter was a careful comparison of the cost of slave labor with the cost of hiring white laborers. And Moberly concluded that the shift, that shifting to free white workers would provide substantial savings to the Jesuits. For the next 20 years, the Maryland Jesuits grappled over whether to sell their human property, to free them, or simply to maintain the status quo. One Jesuit even proposed freeing them and sending them to Liberia, a newly created haven for former slaves in West Africa, championed by the American Colonization Society, founded in the neighborhood of Georgetown. By the 1830s, the Jesuit plantations were becoming increasingly unprofitable. Slavery was coming under moral attack from a rising abolitionist movement. And Georgetown itself had fallen on hard times. A building spree saddled the college with debt. So under the leadership of Reverend Thomas Mullody, who had served as president of Georgetown for much of the 1830s, the Maryland Jesuits made a fateful decision to sell most of their slaves to two Catholic planters in Louisiana, Henry Johnson and Jesse Beatty. Henry Johnson, had, uh, Henry, Henry Johnson had been the governor of Louisiana, um, so this is not, this is not an insignificant uh, person. They agreed to sell the slaves to Johnson and Beatty for $115,000 in 1838 money, which, depending on how you count, is at, uh, at a minimum about $3 million today. They made sure to sell to Catholic owners so as not to betray their religious obligation to care for the slaves' souls. In fact, that was one of the conditions that was put on the sale by, um, by the church in Rome. It wasn't too happy about it. But they did not ask the slaves whether they would like to be sold to Louisiana, which was notorious uh, to black people in the Upper South for being akin to a death sentence. I should say that some of these documents um, can be very tough to take. I mean, they, I, I show them to you um, because I think it's important to confront directly the evidence of slavery in the historical record. Um, but I do recognize that, um, that um, they can be very difficult to, to look at. Now, it turns out the 1838 sale is one of the most richly documented mass sales of slaves in American history. The records offer an unusual window into the domestic slave trade and the uprooting and transplantation of virtually an entire slave community from the Upper South to the Deep South. Historians estimate that roughly a million slaves a million men, women, and children were subjected to forced migration between 1790 and 1860 in the United States, transportation from the Upper South to the Deep South. Some went by land, trekking hundreds of miles. Others were boarded onto steamboats and literally sold down the river. The Maryland Jesuit slaves went by a coastal route. Uh, they sailed from the Chesapeake to New Orleans, a voyage that took a week or two. Uh, some historians refer to it as the second Middle Passage. Now, it's hard to wrap your head around a number like a million. That's a big number. It's, it's, uh, you can only think about it in an abstract way. So I think it's the stories of individuals like, like Solomon Northup, or, or, or community families and communities like the Maryland Jesuit slaves that allow us to grasp uh, the trauma of that second middle passage on a human scale. Now, this 1838 sale is documented in several ways. 
Mulledy signed a contract with Johnson and Beatty in June of 1838 agreeing to sell 272 men, women, and children who are named in the Articles of Agreement. And the terms of the sale are laid out as well, financial transaction. Later that year, Mulledy parceled out the slaves to Beatty and Johnson, and three additional bills of sale uh, identified the people who would be sold to Johnson and those who would be sold to Beatty. There were still other transactions because some of the Jesuit slaves were married to slaves of non-Jesuits. And the Jesuits were under orders from Rome not to separate families. So what to do about this <coughs> situation? The Jesuits appear to have sold some of their own slaves to the owners of their slaves' spouses and purchased other spouses to send with their own slaves to Louisiana. We're still piecing that part together. Before the sale, the Jesuits took a census of the 272 slaves who were slated to be sold, identifying them by family groups in the plantations where they lived, Newtown, St. Inigo's, White Marsh, and St. Thomas Manor. Now, this particular bill of sale is from Thomas Mullody to Jesse Beatty. Uh, and you can see, if you can, if you can read, this is actually a very legible, um, very legible uh, script. Um, you can see that most, while well, most of the people listed in this contract are identified only by their first name, a few last names are included, such as the first name on this contract, Nace Butler. Uh, the first name on the third line at the right, Nace Butler, 50 years, uh, 50 years of age, Bibby, 45, and her infant. Bibby is Nace Butler's wife, Bibby Butler. And the names that follow, the infant, Caroline, uh, Basil, Martha Ann, Anne, Gabe, Bibby, Henry, Tom, Mary, John Lewis, Justin, and Rose are all the butler's children. It was a descendant of Nace and Bibby Butler, a woman named Patricia Bayon Johnson, uh, who has a real talent for genealogy, who first discovered her own family history in these records more than a decade ago. And uh, the work that Patricia Bayon Johnson did tracking her own family history uh, has been a real inspiration and a source of knowledge for those of us at Georgetown working on this history. The 1838 sale involved families that had been formed over multiple generations. They had been in Maryland for a long time, more than 100 years in many cases, and now they were being uprooted and sent to a strange, distant place. Another very important document in tracing the movement of the Maryland Jesuit slaves from the Chesapeake uh, to the Deep South uh, is this document, which is the top of a manifest of a vessel called the Catherine Jackson, which sailed from Alexandria to New Orleans in late November 1838, carrying many of the Maryland Jesuit slaves on board. The original of this manuscript is currently located at the National Archives in Fort Worth. Um, and uh, I, you know, I want to take this opportunity to thank the archivists there for working with us to locate this document and digitize it. One of the important features of, the, of this manifest is that it recorded a lot more last names for this, the Jesuit slaves than one can find in the Jesuits' own record keeping. And I, I've, I've heard a lot sort of over the past year about how great the Jesuit record keeping was. And I'm here to tell you it wasn't that great. Uh, <laughs> they could have done a better job at a number of things. Um, but uh, one of the things that's really built into the Jesuit record keeping is um, a failure to record the last names of the slaves. We know, we, we know they had them from other from subsequent records like the Manifest and records in Louisiana. But those last names in most cases will not appear in the Jesuits' own records. <laughs> 
But those last names include Butler and Diggs and Hawkins and Hill and Merrick and Plowden and Queen and Scott and many others. And, and those of you who are from this area may recognize many of those names um, as uh, common names in, in, this, in this region, so common names among African Americans. Um, and that's because um, the community was divided. There were, there were people who were slaves and people who were free who shared this, these names and these histories. Um, but the sale in 1838 picks up the Jesuit slave community and pulls it out of that context and plops them down in Louisiana. Now, in many cases in the, in the history of the domestic slave trade, it's difficult, very difficult, if not entirely impossible, to trace slaves sold in the Upper South to their destinations in the Deep South. And although there are, there are literally tens of thousands of enslaved people uh, recorded on these ship manifests in the National Archives. And a lot of them have been digitized. You can go on Ancestry.com and search uh, these, manif these manifests. Figuring out what happened to them once they got off these boats is tough to do. And that's another reason why this case, the Georgetown case of the Maryland Jesuit slave community, is so valuable for historical research, because we know where they ended up, uh, at least many of them. Not all of them, but many of them. Some ended up on Henry Johnson's Chatham Plantation in Ascension Parish, Louisiana, while others ended up on Jesse Beatty's West Oak Plantation in Iberville Parish, Louisiana. So we know where they ended up. Moreover, we know that their experience of being bought and sold continued in Louisiana up to the Civil War. So 1838 was not the last time these people were sold. Henry Johnson fell into financial difficulty shortly after purchasing this, uh, all of these slaves. And he had to renegotiate the terms of his purchase with Mullody in the 1840s and 1850s. That money is sloshing around Jesuit and Georgetown coffers for decades. It's sort of hard. It's another, another thing that they weren't that great about keeping records on. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, Henry Johnson sold his plantation, uh, I believe, in the 1850s to a man and I'm not making this up. He was named John Thompson. <laughs> I don't think any relation. The Beatty slaves were sold at least two more times as the plantation passed to Beatty's heirs after he died in the 1850s. Beatty's heirs sold it to the Barrow family in 1853, and the Barrows sold it to the Woolfolks in 1856. So on the eve of emancipation, a portion of the Maryland Jesuit slave community was in the possession of a woman named Emily Woolfolk in Louisiana. Emily Woolfolk was the widow of one of the most infamous domestic slave traders in American history. The records allow us to trace many, but not all, of the Maryland Jesuit slaves into the era of emancipation. Some of them and their children appear in the 1870 census. And once you can find people in the 1870 census, it becomes much easier to, to trace them through the standard, uh, standard methods of, of genealogy. The problem is that for, for many African Americans who are trying to trace their ancestors back to the days of slavery, 1870 becomes a brick wall because the census didn't identify enslaved people by name, just their owners. There are these slave schedules in the 1850 and 1860 census that actually count the number of slaves owned by each owner. But the slaves are only listed by number, not by name. Only by number, not by name. So you have to go to records like the ones I've showed you, property records, baptismal records if they exist, to try to trace gene uh, genealogy back to the days of slavery. So these are the kinds of records that have made it possible uh, for the descendants of the Maryland Jesuit slave community 
to, to be discovered um, and for them to come to know their, their own history as has, been, has been happening for the last several months. But this particular document that you're looking at now, right, I apologize for the, this is definitely unreadable to all of us, uh, but this is, um, this is from a digital scan of a microfilm of documents here at the National Archives in the Freedmen's Bureau records, which are one of the most extraordinary sets of records in all of American history, documenting that, that moment, that process of emancipation. So the document that you're looking at now is a payroll record uh, that was filed with the Freedmen's Bureau in uh, Louisiana uh, at the end of 1865. Um, and this is a payroll record for newly freed people on the West Oak Plantation in Iberville Parish. And at least some of these people uh, were members of the Maryland Jesuit slave community and their children. But they're no longer slaves here. They're, in fact, recorded as freed men. They're men and women. And in this record, this record actually records their wages for the year 1865, an indication that they're, they are now getting paid for their work. This is an image of what freedom looks like in 1865. Is it really freedom? How free were they? These are the kinds of questions that we can begin to ask. Back to Georgetown. Georgetown College and the Maryland Jesuits continued to be involved with slavery after 1838, despite the sale of most of the slaves to Louisiana. Not all of the Jesuit slaves were sent to Louisiana. Some managed to escape being sold, literally by escaping. An 1867 census of slaves emancipated in Maryland in 1864 shows one family of slaves in St. Mary's uh, Parish headed by a woman named Louisa Mason, who was owned by the Corporation of Roman Catholic Clergymen. I think they're the last of the Maryland Jesuit slaves. Slaves continued to provide labor at the college, and students from slave-owning families continued to attend Georgetown. Georgetown College's southern orientation explains why the majority of Georgetown students and alumni who fought in the Civil War fought for, guess which side? The Confederacy. Uh, they fought for a short-lived nation whose cornerstone was slavery. It was really after the war that Georgetown's ties to slavery got buried in the landscape of memory. I'll give you two examples of this. One is in the career of the man on the left, Reverend Patrick Healy of the Society of Jesus, known as Georgetown's second founder. Healy served as president of Georgetown from 1872, uh, 1872 to, or the 1874 to 1882, and uh, helped to build um, several new buildings on campus. Healy was born into slavery. He was the son of an Irish cotton planter in Georgia and a slave woman. His father uh, rec recognized his paternity uh, of Healy and his siblings. Uh, Healy was sent to a Catholic school in the north and ultimately entered the Jesuit order where he rose to prominence to the position of president of Georgetown. But essentially, he passed for white as the, uh, the Jesuits had to conceal his ancestry from the public. Uh, he recently, and this, his ancestry wasn't really, wasn't really discovered and made public until scholars figured it out in the beginning of the 1950s, upon which time Healy was claimed as the first African-American president <laughs> of a predominantly white American University, and he's celebrated in this way at, at, at Georgetown, even though nobody at the time, or very few people at the time, knew that he was not white. 
So we can also see uh, this burial of the history of slavery in Georgetown's school colors, the blue and the gray. Those colors were actually chosen by Georgetown's crew team in the auspicious year of 1876, a year that marked the end of Reconstruction. They chose those colors as a sign of sectional reconciliation between northern and southern students. And uh, this, is the, this is on the Georgetown University Library's webpage. This is, the, uh, this is I believe now, Georgetown's alma mater uh, that, was, that was written for the occasion of the 17, uh, 1876 unveiling of the colors. And today, you know, Georgetown, these are our colors. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing blue and gray right now. I'm, this is Georgetown. Um, but we know that sectional reconciliation, the union of blue and gray after the Civil War was purchased at the expense of the rights of African Americans and the memory of the politics of slavery. So, so white and white, white students from the North and the South, they could really only reconcile with each other if they all forgot about that problem of slavery, which is why they were fighting in the first place. The first black undergraduate at Georgetown was not admitted until 1950. His name was Samuel Halsey, Jr. So think of it. For 150 years, white students were admitted to Georgetown walked through all the doors of opportunity that their education opened up to them, while black students were excluded, despite the fact that Georgetown virtually owes its existence to slave labor. I think compared to that reality, Healy's imperceptible blackness is little consolation. So I, my modest proposal is that going, on, going forward, Georgetown's colors should be blue, gray, and black. So what now? Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, my, my walking tour through the archives uh, is concluding. So we worked on this, we, we worked on this history, we worked on uncovering this history, building the slavery archive, uh, getting the story out to the Georgetown community, uh, hearing from members of our community about what this history meant to them, gathering knowledge from scholars of slavery and emancipation and African-American history about what all of this meant, including uh, Professor Wilder uh, from MIT. Uh, so we gathered all of this knowledge and tried to figure out, well, what, what do we do to come to terms with this history? And uh, so we wrote up a report, this working group that was composed of students and faculty and staff and alumni, a remarkably diverse um, group of people. And um, we came up with a report this is the report, an elegant little document. It's available on uh, Georgetown University's Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation website, slavery.georgetown.edu. It lays out much of this history and provides a, a series of recommendations and rationales for how we should proceed. It suggests, for instance, that we remake that landscape of memory on campus in part by renaming uh, Mullody and McSherry Halls, the two Jesuit presidents who were largely responsible for the sale of the slaves. Um, students protested in the fall, and we, Georgetown changed the names at that time to Freedom and Remembrance Hall until we could come up with something better. So the working group recommended that one of the halls, Mullody Hall, be named after a enslaved man named Isaac, who is the first person listed in the Articles of Agreement. So he symbolizes that Maryland Jesuit slave community that was sacrificed to save Georgetown. We also know that Isaac was the patriarch of uh, the Hawkins family, multiple generations who were transferred, transported, sold and transported to Louisiana. Um, so we know something about Isaac. The second building we recommended to be, be named after a truly remarkable woman named uh, Anne Marie Beecraft, an African-American woman who became a nun 
uh, and uh, in the 1820s and 1830s was a real pioneer in the education of African American women in Georgetown. Not at Georgetown College where they were excluded, but outside the gates. Um, she's largely been forgotten, um, but she ought to be remembered. Uh, one of the great African American historians uh, of the 19th century called her one of the most remarkable people um, to live in the city. So we should remember her. So, so we want to do that. We want to uh, create a memorial uh, to, um, to slavery at Georgetown that will be an enduring monument to that history. We want to create historical plaques around campus that uh, expose this history, excavate it, so that it's no longer buried. Um, we want to continue this research on slavery and its legacies. We have this incredible archive uh, which, which scholars and the public can use to work through so many different aspects of the history of slavery. The Georgetown story is really a microcosm of the whole history of slavery and emancipation in the United States, as, as we can see through one community. Uh, the working group recommended uh, outreach to the descendants of the Maryland Jesuit slave community, both those who were sent to Louisiana and those who might have remained behind. And really one of the great joys of the work that we've been engaged in is to, is to get to know these people, to, to, to help them recover their family histories, uh, to hear their perspective on what this history means to them. Um, you know, I, we've had some groups, um, some people, some groups come to Georgetown. I've, I've been with them in the special collections where, we, where they, they look at these documents you know, in person and find the names of their ancestors. Uh, and that's, for me, has been a, a really remarkable um, experience. You know, I, I think for a long time, I mean, I, I'm an academic. Uh, I write about things that happened a long time ago. Um, and what, for me, what this has done, I think, is just sort of collapse the distance between the past and the present and make it all the more meaningful. Um, so part of the recommendations were, was a, an institutional apology. We're sorry for having participated in this inhumane kind of institution. Apologies may not be worth that much, but if you, if you, back, them out, if you back them up, I think, with uh, substantial gestures of, of, um, of contrition and reconciliation, then, then maybe they do mean something. And finally, uh, I would say that and ultimately, um, the goal is that examining this history, thinking about it, and reflecting upon it will be an inspiration for all of us to search out our own moral blind spots. Where, what, what are we failing to recognize today in the way the university conducts its business, the way we conduct our business? In what ways are we repeating the mistakes of the leadership of Georgetown 150 years ago? Not exactly the same, but our own mistakes that come out of a failure of moral imagination. And especially with respect to the enduring legacies of slavery and racist discrimination today, racism and uh, racist forms of injustice in our own backyard and further afield. And ultimately for me, I think um, the, the tremendous, one of the tremendous values of, of doing this work over the past year is just to see the tremendous response from, from members of the Georgetown community, from descendants, from the public, um, from all of you just showing up here today to listen to me ramble through this history. And I think that what it shows, or what it can show, ultimately, is that history really does matter. So thank you for listening.
So are there questions? If you have a question, please come to one of the microphones so that everybody can hear you. Can we start over there? Um, good afternoon. I'd like to thank you for the work that you've done on this project. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading lately that says that the trauma of slavery is in the DNA of African Americans today, and I'd like to acknowledge that tonight. Um, I also would like to uh, say that um, you asked how this information couldn't be known. I suggest the night that even in the information age we're in today and with the elections upon us, there's information that we still don't know. So um, how, and my question to you is, how was it for you working on this project and what kind of feelings did you experience doing the research? Mm. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I had a, a range of feelings um, and emotions as I engaged in this work. Um, the first was a, um, uh, t a, se a sense of terror. <laughs> um, uh, that was born out of a, a real desire to, to get this history right. Uh, because I, and especially as it became more and more of a, a public kind of enterprise, as newspaper article in the New York Times was starting to write about it, um, I recognized that you know, there, were, there were a lot of people looking very closely at the work that we were doing. And uh, that puts a lot of pressure on you as a scholar. And you just really, really want to get it right. So that was part of it. Uh, just tr curiosity is another. Um, I think curiosity is an important quality for any historian or any, any really thinking person to have. You want to know, well, what, what, how do I make sense of this? How is it possible that um, the Jesuit leaders of Georgetown could baptize their slaves one day and sell them the next? How do you make sense of that apparent paradox? Um, so there's a kind of curiosity to know how did this, how did this happen? What was going through their heads? And, and an even greater curiosity, I think, to know what it meant for the slaves themselves. Was there any way through the records that we have available to, to get at their perspective, which is so hidden in the records? And that's actually one reason why um, it's been so amazing to get to know some of the descendants, because they have family history, they have family lore, especially those who remained in Maryland, uh, the descendants of Louisa Mason, for instance. You know, they, they always knew their family's connection to the Jesuits. Their family continued to have connections to the Jesuits after emancipation. That is not so much in the records, but it's in their family lore. So coming to, coming to being able to learn that was, um, was really uh, just heartening and, uh, and very gratifying. Um, so all of those are, are part of the emotions that I felt as a scholar pursuing this history. Hi, um, I am Anna Mendes. I am a prospective student from the Department of History. Oh, wow. And I'd like to ask um, if other than implantations, uh, if they, the slaves worked um, as domestic slaves and if the Jesuits hired out slaves for the uh, Washington Society, mm -hmm. and yeah. if you have uh, records of that. Yeah. Um, so the slaves in the Maryland Jesuit community and at the college performed a very wide range of labor. Um, out on the plantations, they performed agricultural work. Um, but there were also artisans, there were carpenters and blacksmiths, um, and the managers of those plantations uh, actually hired out their labor to their neighbors, uh, for instance. Uh, women, 
uh, especially around campus, worked as uh, laundresses and cooks. And in terms of the, the college renting out slaves, it wasn't so much that the college rented its slaves to its neighbors in Georgetown. It's that Georgetown neighbors rented their slaves to the college. So there's also that relationship between the college and the neighborhood around Georgetown. Now this is a little, this is not part of that story, but um, if, if any of you don't know the story of uh, a man named Yara Mamut, who lived in the, the neighborhood of Georgetown just blocks away from the college, it's an incredible story. He was an African, uh, he was born in Africa, uh, trans transported through the slave trade to the Chesapeake, uh, lived in the neighborhood of Georgetown. He was a brickmaker and actually managed to earn enough money as a brickmaker to uh, purchase his own freedom. So he and then he lived as a free person on, uh, on Volta Place, making bricks, actually loaning money to neighbors in Georgetown. And he was renowned as a devout Muslim. So Muslims have been around for a long time in this country. Um, and his portrait was actually painted more than once. Uh, and he's, he's, you know, he's one of the faces of the African American community in, in Georgetown that are just so incredibly rare. So it's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable story, and it's just another indication that there are so many stories um, uh, that we still have to tell. That one has been told. Um, I went to Georgetown. I graduated in 62. I slept in Healy Hall, and I've been to Gaston Hall. But when I was at Georgetown, um, everybody had to take large amounts of philosophy. And we, I can remember my senior year, we had five times a week we had ethics. Hmm. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to, there's a certain incongruence I see here. Yeah, you think. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, do the, the, does the, the Georgetown Ethics Department now uh, look at this situation yeah. and discuss it with their, with the, and do the, does the university talk about this? We had to take ethics because we were going to be ethical people. Yeah. And the, yeah. the university doesn't seem like it's behaved ethically. Yeah. Uh, it didn't. Um. But I, I um, one of the one of our hope, one of the our hopes coming out of this this project is that across the university, um, people will integrate and absorb this this history into their classes, no matter what they teach: theology, philosophy, economics, business, performing arts, um, all. Every discipline can think about this history in its own way. Uh, and that's beginning to happen. That is beginning to happen. There are several courses planned for next semester um, that are really engaged with this history. Uh, and I think across the un university community, people are, are talking about it. Not just joggers in Rock Creek Park. Uh, that was great to hear. Um, but across the university. And, and I, it, this is precisely the kind of history that can that can sharpen our understanding of what it can mean to be, what it might mean to be ethical. So I appreciate that. I really appreciate that comment. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your research. Um, I have two quick questions. Uh, first, you joked about John Thompson being uh, one of the slave owners that eventually bought the slaves, but I'm wondering if John Thompson, the coach, has commented on the issue at all, and also uh, historically. Um, Georgetown, the neighborhood, has actually had a large uh, African-American population, even not so much right now. I'm wondering if the community over the years has kind of known and uh, rec even recognized this history while the university itself might have been quiet. Yeah, great. Um, I don't know what Coach has said about this. Um, uh, I know that... Um, uh, that, um, that Coach Thompson was at the event at Gaston Hall on September 1st. So there are 
surely aware. Um, and I know the students on the, I'm sure the students on the team are very aware of this history, as all the students at Georgetown now are. Um, what was your second question? Just if the community oh, right, right. of Georgetown so, itself, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, one of my colleagues uh, in the history department, uh, Professor Maurice Jackson, who actually knows a great deal more about the history of Wa Washington than I do, um, he was very involved in, uh, in a book project called Black Georgetown Remembered, which is a terrific book. Um, and anybody who has any, any interest in the history of, of African American history of Washington really, I think, would, would enjoy and appreciate that book. Um, but that book talks about Georgetown as an African American community um, going back to the era of slavery. So again, there are people who know this history. Um, I don't know if most of the people who live in Georgetown today know that history, um, but it's something we could all learn. Um, I guess considering that for 40 years of the period that you covered, the Society of Jesus didn't exist per se, yeah. so it might be kind of hard to answer this question, but in the document of, of Mr. Queen's yeah. petition, it was witnessed by, a, a, looked to be a priest. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he was Episcopalian, Catholic, if he was Catholic, would he be a Jesuit? Um, I imagine he wasn't good friends with Father Ashton afterwards. It looked like there might be Latin in the second line, I, but I couldn't make it up. Uh, Diggs, of course, is a, is a major Prince George County family. So I'm wondering if we know, how much we know about um, protesting, <laughs> protesting Catholics, uh, yeah. especially given their vows of obedience to Rome and to Baltimore. What kind of, um, what do we know about their conflict um, this guy seems to be someone who uh, was on the side of Mr. Queen. I, if I was dealing with petitions and like this, that's what I would, might conclude. So yeah. what do we know about, about um, priests who found themselves on the opposite side of the mm -hmm. establishment? Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, the witness here is, is uh, Reverend Thomas Diggs, who's another Catholic uh, priest. And I have to say that uh, Reverend Ashton uh, was, seemed to have been a bit of an oddball uh, and an outcast uh, from his, uh, his fellow, uh, fellow Jesuits. There's, as far as I know, there's no building at Georgetown named after Ashton. Um, he's, he's sort of been buried in the landscape of, mer of memory as well. Um, so I don't really know exactly what was going on with Reverend Diggs and Ashton, but uh, who knows. And I should say that, so uh, Professor Will Thomas in Nebraska has really done great work on, on these freedom suits and there's been, there's been some scholarship on them. Uh, the Key family, for instance, was very involved as, as lawyers um, on behalf of the slaves. Um, so that's an interesting side note. Um, but I think it is really important um, to note that there was a big debate within the Jesuit community in the 1820s and 1830s about what to do about slavery. Um, that debate had a lot of sort of dimensions to it. The American-born Jesuits seem to have been more comfortable with slavery than the European Jesuits. So that was a dimension of the debate. Um, there are those who um, didn't think the slaves should be sold, but didn't think they should be freed either. They thought that the Jesuits had a responsibility to be stewards for the souls of their slaves. And that meant keeping them as slaves. Um, but there were other Jesuits who did champion um, schemes for emancipation. Joseph Carberry, for instance, is known to have proposed a scheme of gradual emancipation over a period of years that would have, tur that would have turned the slaves into free tenant farmers on the Jesuit properties. So there's a big and very interesting debate among the Jesuits about what should be done. Thomas Mullody is called back to Rome after, after the sale because they're pretty on the Leader, church leadership was pretty unhappy with what he did, mostly because it's discovered that he uses the proceeds of the sale to pay off the debt of the college, which is one of the things Rome explicitly said he should not do. So they weren't happy with that. But then Mullody is rehabilitated, I guess, and goes back to the, sent back to the States where he then founds Holy Cross, I believe. Yeah. So... Um, uh, there's, there are really no particularly vocal protests, public protests against the sale from within the Jesuit uh, 
or Catholic community that we know of. It does appear that Carberry might have actually harbored uh, Louisa Mason and her family to keep them from being sold to Louisiana, but the details of that are a bit murky. But there was a debate about it. Good evening, and thank you, Professor Rothman, for this tremendous work you're doing. Um, I also appreciate your desire to get it right. Um, it is a very important work. Uh, with that said, you stated that one of the objectives of the Georgetown Memory Project is, to, is outreach to okay. descendants. And you mentioned the work of Patricia Bayoun Johnson. Yeah. And um, I've read some articles, New York Times, Washington Post, and there were statements at the end of the article, if you believe that you're a descendant, please contact us. I wanted to know what efforts are being made uh, by the university to initiate that contact. Uh, you mentioned your colleagues' work from 1989. This story has been known for years, the 1838 sale uh, in particular, yeah. but the story wasn't, wasn't really well known. So aside from academicians knowing and uh, other people in this community, the actual descendants mm -hmm. of the Maryland Jesuit slave community, what is the university doing to reach out to them? Mm -hmm. um, well, part of a few things, maybe not, maybe not everything we should be doing, but a few things. So one thing is uh, that by um, creating these websites, the Georgetown Slavery Archive and the Slavery Memory and Recon Reconciliation website, um, that's a vehicle for people to contact us who think they might be descendants. Who have, so we've gotten a lot of inquiries from people wanting to know if they have a, you know, if they're descendants, how to, how to find that out, um, that sort of thing. So I think these websites have been part of that outreach. Um, trying to do events like this and talk to journalists in, in, uh, in different places, Southern Maryland and Louisiana, that might reach, uh, might reach that public. Just trying to get the story out there so more and more people who think they, they might have some intuition, some sense from family history that they might be connected um, can, can reach out to us. There, there is this separate entity called the Georgetown Memory Project, which is actually independent from what the university is doing. That was, that's, that was set up by our um, alumnus, Richard Cellini. And they've actually been doing a lot of genealogical research. It was Cellini who actually first reached out for, to, uh, to some of the descendants to, to tell them about this connection. So he's continuing his work. We're collaborating with them, trying to, uh, trying to um, um, you know, put out more and more documents that can help people trace these histories. Um, so that's basically what we're, what we're doing. Thank you. And if anybody is watching out there, if on YouTube or C-SPAN, if you recognize, if your name is one of the last names that I've mentioned or you see in the documents, uh, you know, if you are from one of the counties in Southern Maryland or one of the parishes in Louisiana where uh, these folks ended up, if you think you might have a connection, please do reach out to us uh, and we can help you, we can help you find that out. Really excellent scholarship, thank you very much. Um, my question has to do with how easy or difficult was it as an archivist going through these records? You have someone at the University of Nebraska who has a, a, separate, uh, a separate set of scholarly research is going on, Maryland and Georgetown now. How easy or difficult has it been to collect this information? It seems like you've had to go uh, quite far afield to find these documents. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. You really asked a question that is near and dear to my heart. If you, you ask a historian where they get their sources, I mean, it's like, wow, skies open up, uh, sun shines down. Um, so the first place is in Georgetown's own archives. Uh, the Maryland Province Archives, which are the records of the Society of Jesus in Maryland, are 130 boxes of material. Um, Plus, there's other boxes of like, 
connected archives. It's a lot of stuff. Uh, luckily, there's a, there are finding aids, so we've been and and an extant scholarship that cites sources, so we can locate um, you know some of the most relevant material right there at Georgetown. But even just going through the material at Georgetown is a pretty big endeavor. Uh, and luckily, you know, there's a bunch of us, a lot of students in the history department uh, and archivists in the library who are, you know, who are combing through that stuff. But um, that's not where everything is. So I, I think I've shown, shown you a bit where some of that other stuff is. I mean, we've used material here at the National Archives, the, the, the Ship Manifest, the Freedmen's Bureau records. A lot of the material is in archives in Louisiana, courthouses, um, uh, uh, where else, courthouses. Um, so we just try to cast a wide net. And any time you, you sort of smell a potential source, you've got to go chase it down. So this is a, this, we're just beginning. And I think we're really just scratching the surface of all the sources that are really available to research this history. And we really haven't even gotten in to the post-Civil War period very far and what happened to these families afterwards. So it's a big project that requires a lot of partners in a lot of different places. Um, and to me, that's been one of the most uh, interesting parts to it, just sort of chasing down these sources and finding partners who can help us do that. And I should add that the written, that the documentary archive is never sufficient. Uh, we have to supplement you know, what's, what's been written down with things like the oral history um, of descendant families, which tell us things that will never appear in archives and give us a perspective that we can never get any other way. Um, so we have to complement the documentary record with other ways of getting at historical truth. And I think that's also an important dimension of this project. Hi, my name is Ruth Tricoli. I'm the archaeologist for Washington, D.C. And that was a perfect lead-in to my question because I'm a big proponent that archaeological evidence is an additional and parallel record to the written documentation. And it's through archaeology that we can uh, give the voice to the voiceless through the material remains that they left behind. But that's not actually what I came up to here to say. <laughs> um, so uh, I was uh, one of the founding um, directors of the Search for Yara Mahmoud, the archaeological project that you mentioned in Georgetown. Thank you. There's a session Saturday at 3.15. I'm sure I'll be there. Uh, but one of the um, outcomes of that project is that I'm working with a scholar, or the whole team is working with a scholar who's a student at Howard University, a PhD candidate. And his name is Muhammad Abdurrahman. And when you talked about the rationalization of the Jesuits for slavery, uh, Muhammad is working in the archives, the Islamic archives in Morocco. And he has encountered uh, a similar parallel explanation or rationalization for slavery there. And um, he is looking at letters from enslaved Africans who were brought over here and were literate in Arabic and wrote back to the caliphate asking for relief from slavery. And their response was basically, um, you are free in your mind and make peace with it. So in a sense, the rationalization is coming because of the economic aspects. No one wants to start buying the freedom of the, of the slaves, whether they were um, uh, Muslims or not. And it gives you a whole different perspective on what slavery is and how it, it worked in the world system, which is an unexpected um, result of digging on a vacant property in Georgetown. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you. You never quite know where history will take you. I appreciate that. I think, I think that was it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm told that that's, that was the last question. So thank you so much. I appreciate your support.